in 1914. Not long after the sinking of the Titanic, Congress held a hearing about another nautical disaster. The ships, the Monroe and the Nantucket, collided in the fog, killing 41 soldiers. During the examination of uh, the captain of the Monroe, it was discovered that the captain's compass was off by two degrees. And this slight difference over a distance was enough to push this ship off course and into the other vessel. The New York Times printed a photo after the court hearings of the two captains sobbing together. Run writer said, this is a moving reminder of the tragic consequences of misorientation. Today, we are continuing this series on the minor prophets, and modern saints. In this series, we're looking at each one of these minor prophets in the Hebrew Bible, these 12 short books that contain messages of challenge and of hope. The prophets in the Bible, they hold up a mirror to the people of God to reveal the reality of the way things are in the world. They challenge the people of God towards faithfulness. So we're placing these prophets in conversation with what we're calling a modern saint. That is simply a Christian whose life or message in some way might reflect the life and message and character of the prophets we're studying each week. Now, I realize that word saint probably has a lot of baggage for some of us. Um, These are individuals who are simply people. They're saints simply because of the graciousness of God and God's Spirit within them. They aren't more or less saints than, well, any of us. They are humans. Not perfect. They may disappoint us. Their lives are complicated, but so are ours. And I hope that by engaging with the prophets and these more modern people, we might hear a message. A message that's not just for people a long time ago in a different place, but a message that might speak to us as Christians today. And so today, we're talking about the prophet Amos. Amos is likely uh, the oldest prophet in the minor prophets. Um, His book perhaps contains the very first messages of a biblical prophet that was written down and compiled. Amos lived during the time when the northern and southern kingdom of Israel had split in half. And Amos was not a professional prophet or priest. Amos was a farmer. He lived in the southern kingdom, but was on the border of the northern kingdom. And as he watched this northern kingdom continue to flourish and grow in wealth and power, he saw that there were some problems. See, Amos saw that underneath this nation was a sickness in the midst of their earthly success. While the political and religious leaders and the wealthy people of the northern kingdom found themselves to be quite comfortable, they had begun to take on the practices of their neighboring nations, specifically things like putting their own success and wealth over the needs of the poor and the hurting. These people have begun to worship other gods, and also worship the God of wealth and self and success. Gods we are still tempted to worship today. So Amos, a brilliant poet, uses irony to reveal to the people how they are complicit in the harm of others. While they seem to, from the outside, have it all together, Amos Amos reveals a people whose very hearts are misaligned. So I want to read first from Amos chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, to get us into the world of Amos and Amos's message. The word of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah, of Judah in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither and the top 
of Mount Carmel dries up. For thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus and for four I will not revoke my punishment. Because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. Amos sounds like a fun time at a party, right? Immediately bringing this voice of judgment on the nation first Damascus, one of the neighboring nations. And likely, Amos' first hearers would have begun to hear this message and start to cheer. Yes, hear, hear. Amos is saying exactly what we want to say down with our enemies. God's going to get them. Amos goes through this chapter naming all of these neighboring nations and all the ways that they have done harm. You can imagine the people becoming more and more excited, playing on their tribal instincts that are within all people. Yes, you tell them, Amos. And then, (laughs) it's a setup. Read Amos 2. We'll read verses 4 through 7a. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah, that is that southern kingdom, and for four I will not revoke the punishment. They have rejected the instructions of the Lord. They have not kept his statutes. They have been led astray by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. So I will send a fire on Judah, and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver. And the needy for a pair of sandals, they who trample the head of the poor, into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Amos' poetry then turns on the people of God. Judah, the southern kingdom, and Israel, the northern kingdom. I, I only read the first portion of the declaration against the north, but it goes on and on. It's the longest of all the accusations. You can imagine Amos' hearers who'd been riled up into a nationalistic frenzy by the earlier verses and now they get a dose of sobering reality. God is not just unhappy with how their neighbors are living, but has zeroed in on their foolishness and their rebellion. They have ignored God's commands and calls. Ironically, Despite the people's worship of God and participating in all the right religious festivals, despite their history with God, despite their financial security and success, despite all the things that made them feel superior to everybody else, God includes them in this declaration against the nations, for they have done great harm. They have trampled those in need. They have pushed the afflicted out of the way. God brings forth this language of justice because God cares about how people treat people in need. See, I believe we can't read the Bible, we can't read the prophets, we can't read the words of Jesus and not discover that how we treat those in need is a top-tier theological issue. The people of God, since the day they were rescued from slavery in Egypt, were supposed to be different. They were supposed to act differently. And Amos uses this poetry to reveal how they're not acting any different than any of their neighbors. Despite the northern kingdom's financial comfort, they have violated God's call to care for those who have less and those who are hurting. Our saint this week is Shane Cleborn. We're putting him in conversation with the prophet. Cleborn is an activist and leader whose life is marked by making care for those in need a top-tier issue. Uh, He lives uh, right in Philadelphia, in Kensington, in fact. Uh, Just this week, I was with Shane at a prayer meeting with Palestinian pastor Munther Isaac, And so this saint is one who hits very close to home for us. He grew up like many of us did in church, going to youth group and worship. He grew up with Christians around him. And 
When he went to college at Eastern University, just down the road, and was pursuing his own faith in Jesus, in the way of Jesus, he became discouraged by the way of Western American churches tended to operate specifically and how they cared for those in need. He watched what was happening for those in need just down the road in Philadelphia, how people were being ignored and even harmed sometimes by religious institutions. So he just started showing up in places that others wouldn't go. He got to know people living in the margins, people in need, people cast out. He made friends. He learned about God from their deep faith. He would go on to do all kinds of things as he seek to follow Jesus. He spent time working with Mother Teresa. He spent time as an intern in one of the largest mega churches in the nation. And then he came back to Philadelphia to start a simple way, a Christian community of radical love and hope in the Kensington neighborhood. And he has not stopped advocating for his neighborhood and his neighbors ever since. Even now, the simple way is buying homes in their neighborhood that have been abandoned and forgotten. They're renovating them and then selling them to their neighbors for only $30,000. I don't know if you've looked at the housing market lately. Selling them for only $30,000 and they can be financed by the simple way with an interest-free loan. In his book, Irresistible Revolution, Claiborne writes, I asked participants who claim to be strong followers of Jesus whether they spent time, whether Jesus spent time with the poor. And 80% said, yes, Jesus spent time with the poor. Later in the survey, I sneaked in another question. I asked that same group of strong followers whether they spent time with the poor, and less than 2% said they did. I learned a powerful lesson. We can admire and worship Jesus without doing what he did. We can applaud what he preached and stood for without caring about the same things. We can adore his cross without taking up ours. I had come to see that the great tragedy of the church is not that rich Christians do not care about the poor, but that rich Christians do not know the poor. So, Claiborne moved into the neighborhood. It's the same phrase Eugene Peterson would use when translating John 1, 14, as Jesus takes on flesh and is born at Christmas time, God moved into the neighborhood. Claiborne was fed up with the way that many expressions of Christianity did not look like Christ. And like Amos, it calls us to something better. A faith that takes Jesus' words and actions seriously. A faith that knows people, the kind of people Jesus would get to know. This is the heartbeat of the book of Amos. The message that Amos receives from God is that God is disgusted when his people go through all the religious motions but are not changed to live differently. I want to read the most famous section of Amos. Amos 5, 21 through 24. Amos gives this message from the Lord. I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I'm almost tempted to just close the Bible and say, Amen, good luck. <laughs> Some have taken these verses and used them to condemn Jewish festivals or rituals. Others have taken these verses to say, See, we shouldn't gather or worship in a church at all. We should just go do activism. But that's not really what Amos is saying. Amos is not opposed to worship. Instead, Amos is revealing how God feels about our worship when it is done simply for ourselves for our own sense of importance, but doesn't lead to transformation in our lives and in the communities around us. See, I believe our gathered worship should inform our living, and our living should inform our gathered worship. Amos says God desires justice to roll like water. 
Righteousness to flow like an ever-flowing stream. We're probably familiar with that verse. Dr. Martin Luther King used that language as he dreamed about what our nation could be. But, but what does it mean? Justice here is simply a word that means actively making things right. Repairing things, restoring things, helping things be the way that they should be. And righteousness. Now we may think of it just about being holy, and that's part of it. But the Hebrew word here for righteousness, it's all about right relationships with God and each other. So in a time when many of us are concerned with being right, Amos tells us how important it is to be right with one another and God. So this is your relationship advice for the day. Couples, you may want to take a note of this, but please don't elbow anyone, okay? It is more important to be right with one another than to be right about something. (laughs) It is more important to be right with one another than to be the one who is right. God is more interested that we are right with God. We are right with our neighbors. We seek righteousness. Then if we get every line of doctrine or fancy theological word down pat, God is more concerned that we love our neighbors and care for the hurting. Then we read from the right Bible translation or sing the just right hymns or have the right statement of faith. Now, I'm not saying Bible translations and the words of our hymns and the words of our theology are not important because I have opinions on all of them. I will tell you them all. I went to more than enough school to learn all about all these things, but, but even the rightest of words, as the Apostle Paul might say, without love, It's just a resounding gong. So, there are those who would say, hey, keep this justice work stuff out of churches. God cares a lot about justice. About being right with each other in our world. Okay, so does this mean we should just dissolve this worship business, right? If God really cares about righteousness and justice, maybe we should become some kind of lobbying political action group instead. (laughs) By no means. See, Amos wants people to worship. In fact, worship shapes them. It's just they haven't let the worship shape them. In fact, from our reading of the text, it seems that perhaps they're not even worshiping together, that the wealthy are doing their own thing. The problem isn't worship. The problem is when worship doesn't lead to changed living. The problem is trying to have a worship that might isolate us from what might challenge us, including God. But justice and righteousness flow like water, like a stream. The language that we read there, this water language, it's it's language that's referring to like like a stream that bubbles up. My parents recently uh, moved to the area and uh, the house they bought in the yard, it's just kind of soggy all the time. They thought maybe it was a drainage issue or something like that. It turns out they have some springs in their yard that are just constantly bringing forth water. My dad tried to plant a tree and halfway through digging the hole, the hole was just full of water. And that's the language that we're seeing here, that that in our lives, righteousness, justice might bubble forth. When you were to dig into our worship, to dig into our lives, we might see justice, righteousness, spring forth. See, Amos believes in gathered worship, but his audience has just miscalibrated their worship away from the character of God. Their compasses are off. Why do you worship? What are you hoping to happen as a result of this gathered community, of your faith in your life? What do you expect God to do among us? Are we open to God changing us, shaping us, transforming us? Theologian James K.A. Smith says, worship works from the top down, you might say. In worship, we don't just come to show our devotion to God and give God our praise. We're called to worship because in this Encounter, God remakes and molds us top down. Worship is the arena in which God recalibrates our hearts, reforms our desires, rehabituates our love. Worship isn't just something we do. It's where God does something to us. 
Worship is the heart of discipleship because it is the gymnasium in which God retrains our hearts. Did you wear your gym shoes to worship today? See, the people Amos is writing to, they've worshipped plenty, but, but they've not lived in a way that reflects the character of God, the God they serve. They have not let God shape them through their worship. I think there are two lies that we're tempted to believe that Amos helps us confront. The first is that Christian community and gathered worship aren't important. There's so much hypocrisy in the church, we should just do our faith on our own. Or that, that social justice is a political issue and so we shouldn't talk about justice in the church. That this justice work, this social justice will distract us from the mission. No. Gathered worship and acts of justice and righteousness are both vital ways we align ourselves. We orient the compasses of our hearts to the character and the mission of God. We hear of stories like Shane Claiborne's, we read the message of Amos and we think that sounds good, but what does it mean to me? When I named this series Minor Prophets and Modern Saints, I did it mostly for the poetry of the language. And I was hoping that it would help us not let these characters, these messages be too abstract, too distant. And while I was preparing this week, I found this quote from Claiborne that kind of messed up my whole series. It says this, Sometimes people call us here at the simple way saints. Usually they either want to applaud our, li- applaud our lives or live vicariously through us. Or they want to write us off as superhuman and create a safe distance. One of my favorite quotes written on my wall here in bold black marker is from Dorothy Day. Don't call us saints. We don't want to be dismissed that easily. So today, I hope that we don't dismiss what Amos had to say about worship about care for those in need. I hope we don't dismiss the work of Shane Claiborne just 30 miles from where we stand today. I think it's fair to call him and his friends saints, but I would call each and every one of you who choose to follow Jesus a saint too. See, we believe that our righteousness, our saintliness is a gift by Jesus placed onto us like a robe. And because of this gift, then we can be transformed from the top down where justice and righteousness bubble up in our lives. So yes, the people in Shane's community don't have any superpowers. Outside of that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same spirit that's alive in you. Simply what they have done is set their lives, set the compasses of their hearts, calibrated themselves on Jesus. Have we? Or do perhaps. We need a bit of a recalibration. This morning, as we reflect on this message from Amos, a message we might read with heaviness, deep, deep reflection, may we choose today to center the compass of our hearts on the King of love. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the prophet Amos. And we thank you for the vision you gave this prophet to call out to those who were comfortable and successful, but missing the point. May you help us calibrate our hearts, set the compass of our hearts on the true north that is Jesus And may it carry us forward so that our very lives may flow with righteousness and justice for all humanity, all creation, even our neighbors, even ourselves. Amen. Hey, I'm Evan Duncan, the senior pastor of the Baptist Church of Westchester, and I'm so glad you found us on YouTube. I just want to thank you for engaging with us. If if there is more you want to know about our church, about ways to connect, or, or even if you want to support the work of God in our community, you can visit bcwc.org. That's also how you can connect with us. As you go, I want to share with you a blessing, a benediction that comes out of This book, A Common Prayer, A Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals. 
May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you in the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace and be the church.